Emmanuel, can you, can you hear me? I'd rather just sit. I think it's more relaxed. Um, also, thanks to Pierre and to the Maison Francaise. I'm really, really um, grateful. Um, and it's really great to be here because this project, I've actually been working on it with these guys for many, many years in teams, in, in conferences, in late night emails with Pierre. Who I desperately would send you questions about this. It was a long time ago. Remember that? Um, and so these are some of the people who I work this with, so it's really great to have them, them here. Um, uh, it really sort of started, what well started, we had all been working on studying this idea of mercantilism, this, this economic, the supposed economic idea which never existed uh, sort of before, it was supposed to be the general economic idea before the end of the 17th century, before the 18th century. The idea that states, that there were these economists that wanted state-controlled economies and they wanted to control limited amounts of bullion. And people sort of, and they, they wanted state-run industries. There were, there's no question that there were economists that talked about these things, but one of the things that we've been studying, this argument's going, been going on for a long time, is that it really wasn't a true unified system of thought. No one said the word mercantilist except Adam Smith, and he was just talking about businessmen in general. Um, and so these, we were having these seminars talking about mercantilism and sort of fighting over it. And one of the things that dawned on me is that we were not fighting over or discussing so much laissez-faire or free market thought. Um, and that seemed to me quite remarkable because we did something which so many of us do, we take the idea for granted as this kind of free-floating truth that we all have our own idea about. And I thought that was kind of sort of remarkable. Now, Pierre had actually written this book um, uh, about self-interest before Adam Smith, in which he showed that there wasn't a creation moment for free market thought. One of the myths of free market thought is that Adam Smith sort of created it with some help from some uh, phys French physiocratic thinkers. The fact in history is there are no instant creations. Um, it just doesn't work like that. That's almost the kind of like Christian narrative of free market thought. There's like a creation moment. And so Pierre's book goes back into all these morals and these moralistic discussions, which I did in my PhD on the idea of prudence. And he did this book on self-interest and amour propre and self-love. And these are, all in, these are all involved ideas, but they're also ideas that go very, very, very far back. This is moral philosophy, and moral philosophy starts in antiquity. And so the people who were writing about this were very aware of it, whether it be La Rochefoucauld, whether it be Adam Smith. Their eyes were turned backwards in, in so many ways. Um, one of the things that struck me, and, um, and I'm going to talk about this more in March at Princeton, that essentially economic history, I think, is a very great field right now. There are amazing people doing amazing books. John has just finished an amazing book, which I really recommend people read. And Carl's written a number of books. In fact, one of my chapters is heavily based on his book, Casualties of Credit. So I'm really happy that he's here tonight, because I couldn't have done the book without any of their work. Um, but one of the things that has struck me is that if you look at different fields, for example, the history of politics, the history even of history, there were these big methodological reckonings in the 1970s where you had these huge arguments over how we should study the history of political ideas, for example. Um, you had the Cambridge School and the Hopkins School of political thought. You had the work of Donald Kelly, from which I think a lot of this really comes, um, studying historical and political thought. There were big methodological fights about how we study a historical idea in context. In fact, I think we're still, we should still be arguing about what context means. Um, and so there was this sort of really grand moment where there were these enormous fights about the history of politics in particular uh, and how we should study it. And one of the ideas, and I think the sort of masterwork in all of this for whatever problems it has, and it has problems, but it's still a really remarkable and visionary work, is J.G.A. Pocock's The Machiavellian Moment, in which he showed in many ways that the 
the sort of American Republican tradition and then other Republican traditions or traditions of political liberty, such as some in England, uh, or Republican traditions in England, had this long sort of lineage going back to Florentine Republicanism and therefore back to classical Republicanism. In economic history, we have had less of that. And I think that's problematic. And so, um, for example, it, it, it sort of seemed to me startling that free market thought, laissez-faire, had not had one of these treatments. Now, remember that it's not kind of, it, it's quite obvious to me, Adam Smith, by the way, he didn't, Adam Smith never uses footnotes. He wasn't a great scholar, Adam Smith. He was a much loved professor. Um, and I could say lots of things about Adam Smith. Um, uh, but he was a moral philosopher, which meant at the time that he and his, his mentor, Hume, were steeped in Ciceronianism. Cicero was in everything. If you read his works, and if you're reading lots of Cicero, which I did for this book, and I really enjoyed doing it, I'm constantly coming, and I didn't do this in the book, and I should have, but that would have been speculation. I'm constantly coming across lines in Smith's various writings that are clearly just out of Cicero. He doesn't footnote. He's constantly using Cicero. He's constantly quoting Cicero. He's constantly paraphrasing Cicero. He is a Ciceronian. Hume was more obvious about this. And so this heritage is so conscious for them that I believe, and Carl is really the expert here about this, that they didn't actually need to come out and say it. People knew it, that Ciceronianism and this kind of Stoic and other forms of classical philosophy, but in particular, a kind of Ciceronian Stoicism, was it was supposed to be common knowledge for the, the elite. It was known that people were going to know that. And so basically, I did this genealogical thing where I just moved backwards. And at a certain point, I knew that Cicero was important. I, I, keep run, I kept running into Cicero in the archives, in 17th century books, in these books of morality. I used to study the Roman historian Tacitus, and Cicero and Tacitus were kind of taught in tandem, often in conflict. But I kept running into Cicero, and so I just went on the hunch that, look, there's, there's, there's a history here. If, Smith, if, if Cicero is so important to Smith, and I've seen Cicero elsewhere, maybe I'll just walk this backwards and see what I find. And I kept finding Cicero everywhere I looked, and the sort of story unfolded, and I had a big story. And that is kind of what you want as a historian. Um, now, what this means is, it's problem, again, and I'm sorry, because I have lots of friends in 18th century studies, and they're here, and we have arguments about this. But 18th century studies is often a field in which people declare things invented in the 18th, in the 18th century. I don't fully believe that. I think there are things that are created, but I do think they also thought in terms, uh, they were looking backwards. People were looking backwards. In the 18th century, they start also looking forwards while they're looking backwards. But so, um, in any case, what I've done is not necessarily typical for the history of Adam Smith, the history of, of free market thought, which was seen as a creation of the 18th century. I feel very strongly that it is really grounded in a Ciceronian tradition, which evolves into a Christian tradition of all these Ciceronian people in late antiquity who are also struggling with Cicero. And it moves out, and Cicero keeps showing up in the funniest places, always with this idea, possibly, of general equilibrium that we get to in the 17th century with Newton, this idea that things can just work on their own. This is an idea which causes much passion today, it will cause people to attack you somewhat, perhaps irrationally, but unfairly, but it will cause lots of passion, this idea. And so this book is a little creepy. I've already gotten some hate mail. I'm not good at that. Like other people are like, what do you care? I'm just like, it freaks me out. Um, but maybe that's a good thing, not necessarily for me, but it's a good sign. Um, one thing I do want to say, and I don't say this lightly, I have never seen fully functional general equilibrium. The idea that an economy just works on its own with just pure supply and demand. I've just never seen it. And every example, I went just as a kind of medical test each time I got to a period, I always found the conditions for free market thought. And there are more liberal periods than other, but the role of the state 
changes and, uh, and is often remarkable. And in 19th century Britain, the moment, as Frank Trentman called in his brilliant book, Free Market Nation, the British Empire was the thing keeping this free market going, and it was doing so with gunships and torture and all sorts of other things. So, you know, it's, there was always a condition. Some of the conditions were harsh. Some were just incredibly helpful, like the sponsorship of infant industry in the United States. This was not a free market country. It was a country started by people doing with an industrial strategy, and that's Alexander Hamilton, of light tariffs reinvested in infant industry. And I find it incredible that there's this mythology in America that it's a sort of free market country. And so that's sort of where I'm coming from today. Um, those were uh, some of my hopes in writing this book were to stop the myth, change the way economics are spoken about, change the discourses about economics. I don't know if I'll succeed, but I hope at least today we can have a good discussion about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so, did, did, um, sorry. this is a, a, a deeply learned book and uh, one that joins philosophy and erudition, as uh, Gibbon said, good history should. Uh, in fewer than 300 pages, uh, it gives us a bird's eye view of the entire history of free market thinking from Cicero to the present. Uh, so here, here are the main takeaways as I see them. One, an extreme version of laissez-faire thinking that flourished in the 20th century has few antecedents in the long history of the free market. Two, uh, the conventional opposition between free market as championed by Adam Smith and mercantilism uh, conventionally represented by Colbert is false. Uh, Colbert and Smith exemplify two different but related strains of free, free market thought. Three, in the story that Jake tells, Colbert is the hero of uh, free market thought, and I should add that um, uh, Jake is uh, the authority on Colbert. On the other hand, uh, Friedrich Hayek and, to a lesser extent, uh, Milton Friedman are polemical targets. Uh, four, because governments have a necessary role in setting up and regulating markets, the familiar opposition between free markets and government is uh, a fantasy that needs to be discarded. These points are argued brilliantly and with verb. Uh, the book is both a scholarly intervention and a powerful contribution to public debate. Since we are in an academic setting, uh, I would like to complicate things a little and uh, challenge some aspects of an otherwise compelling uh, demonstration. On the one hand, the book argues that most economic or proto-economic thinkers from Cicero onward were advocating for some form of free market. On the other hand, there are many strains in, uh, of uh, free market thinking, some agrarian, some industrial, some moralistic, some more cynical, and one may sometimes wonder what they all have in uh, common. So it would seem that the, the book hesitates uh, between a strong definition of free markets and a, a weak one. What I mean is the, the weak one would entail some belief in the benefits of free trade or the opinion that price controls are counterproductive. The stronger one, embodied by Friedrich Hayek or Milton Friedman, would see a fundamental convergence between economic freedom and political freedom. 
And by the end of the book, it is the strong form of a free market thought that is a, a polemical target. Yet, I would argue that the book itself shows that these claims of an essential connection between free markets and free institutions have a long history. And the, the story of this connection was told by Albert Hirschman in his classic book, uh, The Passions and the Interests, in which uh, the author sought to recover, I quote the subtitle of the book, political arguments for capitalism before its triumph. Simply put, the thought was that societies were self-sustaining mechanisms and the human passions were self-regulating. Greed acts as a check on the lust for power, for example. And this initially deeply pessimistic assessment was followed by a surprisingly upbeat prediction economic growth propelled by greed would result in less despotic government and in freer and more tolerant societies. And this is what Hirschman calls the Montesquieu Stuart doctrine. And as uh, Jake notices near the end of the book, there are striking conceptual similarities between the thought of Hayek and the thought of the French Jansenist jurist Jean Domain, who belongs to the intellectual tradition that Hirschman analyzes. And in Jake's words summarizing that tradition, it is the idea that uh, competing acts of sin canceled each other out. Now, Hirschman is aware that such, such optimism was not borne out by historical events. Uh, he is non nonetheless fascinated by this train of thought and in trying to give an assessment of it, he begins by telling the following Jewish story. So this is the story as told by Hirschman in The Passions and the Interests. Uh, the rabbi of Krakow interrupted his prayers one day with a wail to announce that he had just seen the death of the rabbi of Warsaw 200 miles away. The Krakow congregation, though saddened, was of course much impressed by, with the visionary powers of their rabbi. A few days later, some Jews from Krakow traveled to Warsaw and, to their surprise, saw the old rabbi there officiate in what seemed to be tolerable health. Upon their return, they confided the news to the faithful and there was incipient snickering. Then a few undaunted disciples came to the defense of their rabbi. Admitting, admitting that he may have been wrong on the specifics, they exclaimed, nevertheless, what vision. <laughs> and, um, and Hirschman um, you know, glosses on that story in the following way, as I quote him, ostensibly this story pours ridicule on the human ability to rationalize belief in the face of contrary evidence. But at a deeper level, it defends and celebrates visionary <coughs> and speculative thought, no matter if such thought goes astray. The same remark could be made by the various places in the book in which free market advocates are described as doctrinaire, and detach from reality. About, I quote, um, 20th century orthodox free market economist, Jake writes, I quote, it was not so much an academic position as an article of faith or fanatical vision of the state as a force of evil. Perhaps we could say with the Krakow congregation, nevertheless, what vision? Now, Jake is right that Smith, as a Stoic, did not buy into the vision of vices canceling each other out. And contrary to popular belief, classical political economy was initially based on a rejection of the greed is good paradox and the neo-Epicureanism that had been popularized by Bernard Vanville 
Mandeville in the early 18th century. Yet, this other ancient intellectual tradition, Epicureanism, which Cicero despised because it described humans as pleasure seekers, lurks behind the story we read in the book. Hayek, for instance, read Mandeville as an early exponent of the idea that society is a self-regulating mechanism. So Jake's history of the free market has a strong stoic uh, bent. As such, it deserves to be told because it has a new and unfamiliar ring. But the more familiar Epicurean story also deserves a hearing. Yeah, you're the first person to call me not Epicurean in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting old. Uh, I'd like to say thanks to Pierre for inviting me to participate in this event and to Maison Francaise for, for hosting. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here among friends, uh, a pleasure to engage with this interesting and ambitious book. Um, I admire its scope. Um, as has already been said, it ranges over two millennia. Uh, I might add that it ranges over four or five research languages. Um, it's very impressive. Um, I like the big questions at its heart. Um, what is free market thought? Um, how has it evolved over time? Um, my responses go in uh, several different directions. Um, I, I want to start with one of the one of the broadest responses I have to the book. Um, the, the question that that occurred to me first was, why write a long and learned book about the evolution of free market thinking? Um, now, obviously, to correct some major misconceptions. Um, but also, I think, uh, and as Emmanuel has already noted, with an eye to the challenges of the present. Consider this sentence from the conclusion. One thing is certain, free market thought will need to be much more adaptable and sophisticated than it has been since World War II if we're to see our way clear of the daunting obstacles that humanity now faces. What can the free market tradition be adapted to meet the challenges humanity now faces? Challenges such as inequality, a frame, democracy, and of course, climate change. This may be the hope that prompts writing a substantial and fairly celebratory book about market philosophy, but is it a justified hope? Many would argue that the free market tradition is one of the sources of those daunting challenges we now face. Growing economic inequality is quite directly linked uh, and justified by the market philosophy of the last 40 years, and not just the utopian ultra-libertarianism of a Milton Friedman. The origins of climate change lie in the Industrial Revolution, which free market thinking since the 19th century has justified and rationalized. The doubling of total CO2 emissions since 1990 <coughs> is partly a function of an economic globalization heralded and celebrated by free market thinkers. Now, one might argue here with Jake that these problems are functions of an ideologically narrow and rigid vision of the market. That it is precisely the thrust of the book to show that such narrowness and rigidity are not intrinsic to market philosophy. That the tradition has vastly more to offer. One of the many strengths of the book is the way it shows the malleability of market thinking, the ways it has always responded to the past, uh, excuse me, in the past, to deeply felt political and social needs of the age. To, to give just a few examples uh, from the book, uh, the need of the early Christian church to make its peace with money making so it could generate the resources needed to build institutions. The need of Italian Renaissance merchants to square the pursuit of profit with sustaining virtuous republics. The search for peace among great powers in war-torn 18th century Europe. Um, or the need to accommodate an industrial society in 19th century Britain. Market philosophy has evolved and adapted to meet each of these very different challenges. 
Given this history of flexibility and pragmatism, perhaps the free market tradition can be adapted to meet the enormous challenges of the present. But some skepticism is in order here, I think, and on the basis of what Jake tells us himself in the book. The book shows effectively that market philosophy was used to address a surprising variety of problems in the past. But these seem almost without exception to be the problems of the powerful and the rich, rather than those of the poor and the vulnerable. A word that appears with remarkable frequency in the book is oligarchy. Cicero's market philosophy was in service to a Roman oligarchic order. Adam Smith's project, Jake writes, was a remarkably ambitious attempt to reconcile the agrarian oligarchy of the time and a vision of a self-regulating market with the rise of commerce and empire. Um, Grotius uh, served the regent oligarchy of Holland and especially the interests of the Dutch East India Company. Was market philosophy an oligarchic tradition in the past, much as it has been for the last 50 years? Uh, to be sure, there were exceptions. For John Stuart Mill, I'm quoting Jake, the best government was not to be found in oligarchy, but in common citizens. But even Mill worked for the East India Company, and again, quoting Jake, never stopped defending either the company or imperialism. I think it's reasonable, in light of these examples, to consider the limits of market thinking and its constrained capacity to meet the daunting challenges of the present. Market thinking has been remarkably flexible and adaptable, Jake shows. But it would be harder to argue that it was ever democratic, except perhaps in the guise of the utopian libertarianism of the Milton Friedman, um, which in practical terms served corporate interests. Does market philosophy have what it takes to come to grips with climate change? What about economic inequality? I'd be interested to hear more from Jake about this. Um, in some respects, this struck me as a very optimistic book. What justifies that optimism? Um, let me move on to making a, sec a, a second point now. Um, a central thrust of the book is to show that it was only quite recently that the state came to be posited as the nemesis of the free market. I wholeheartedly agree with that conclusion. Um, if we move off the terrain of ideas, um, where Jake's book dwells mostly, and into that of policy, it becomes even clearer that free markets in reality have never existed without the exertions of states. And I think it's clarifying to reflect on why this is. Commerce requires protection if it's going to flourish. Protection from shakedowns by the powerful. Protection from angry consumers. Protection from workers seeking a greater return for their labor. Protection from all forms of violence, be it the attacks of bandits or pirates, the assaults of invaders, or expropriation by a state. It is typically states that provide this protection in return for regular payments in the form of taxes. Charles Tilley has compared this relationship to a protection racket. Be that as it may, market freedom is impossible without such protection. There can be no meaningful market freedom without a suspension of violence, without guarantees for property rights, without guarantees uh, for the enforcement of contracts, and so many other amenities that states supply to markets. Freedom and protection, which we often imagine as opposites are in fact complementary. And this is so because commerce is inescapably embedded in a world of competing protection suppliers. The problem for market societies has always been to determine the proper bounds of the state's protection and the right shape of the space of freedom. I wonder if the free market thought of the past offered resources to draw on here, given our own particular challenges. This brings me to the last question I want to raise for Jake. Um, and it's really um, where his work, I think, meets uh, my own in its, in its sensibility. I want to ask, what sustains your hope that history
can be an effective form of critique uh -huh. on this subject and at this moment. You've written a book for a broad public seeking to bring the past to bear on the present, to show how a better grasp of history can challenge and change current understandings of free market ideas. This implies a belief that history retains some weight, some force, as a mode of contemporary critique. But, but what is its force against a universalist, ahistorical, and scientific discourse of economics? Why should its adherents care that in the past markets were misunderstood, for surely that is the way that they would see it? What makes you hope that a wider public is reachable in a culture in most respects unmoored from the past and obsessed only with itself, its present, and its very immediate future. Thank you. So let me uh, join in this chorus of voices praising this book. It's absolutely beautifully written. It's eminently accessible to a broader audience. The book claims in a rather understated manner to be a history of the idea of the free market, but in reality it does a remarkable job introducing the readers to really the full history of ideas about capitalism. Many people in the last 40 or 50 years or so, or so have tried to write the book that will replace Robert Heilbronner's classic The Worldly Philosopher. Jake's book might actually be the one that succeeds. This book is not only a masterful overview of a very long history of the free market, it also makes an important political argument that both Pierre and John alluded to earlier. While it traces the ideas of free market across 2,000 years, it shows that only during the 20th century was the idea of free markets taken literally. Only then did it become commonplace to believe that markets exist embryonically in the human genome. As long as all government was removed from the economic sphere, free markets would emerge and they would ensure that humanity's unmediated selfish desires would be channeled in a manner that ensured a Panglossian world. At any other point in history, Jake shows, it was well recognized that free markets required both a strong state and a strong sentiment of virtue in order to function. Indeed, Jake shows, from Cicero to Adam Smith, that most writers recognize the many ways whereby economic behavior was situated in culture, politics, society, and different notions of the self. In order for free markets to function in such complex societal and psychological topologies, these writers specified a variety of necessary roles for the government and a number of ways to foster just the right kind of virtues. While writers of the past differed as to the specifics, there was an undeniable consensus among them that statecraft and education mattered. So whether to Aquinas, Colbert, or Mandeville, Jake shows that the Hayek or Friedman notion that markets are inscribed in our DNA and that they have the power to alchemically transmute undiluted selfish hedonism into the public good would have been absolutely laughable to those gentlemen. This, I might add, makes it rather humorous that Amazon.com has filed Jake's book under the categories of libertarianism <laughs> and free enterprise and capitalism. More hate now. I'm going to get more hate now. <laughs> well, you're ranking very high on those. So, <laughs> so uh, we're, of course, not here just to praise the book, but also to prod a bit. Uh, so I don't expect you to respond to all of these questions, uh, but maybe uh, you will to one or two of them to get the conversation going. So I'm curious to hear a little bit more about the decision behind the title of the book, in particular, you know, why you called it free markets and not just the market. Uh, given that we're so accustomed to thinking of the free market as, markets, as a market society with minimum intervention by the government, it might have been easier for your readers to take in your argument that virtue and state is nevertheless necessary had you just turned it the market. So um, you've already um, 
uh, uh, indeed, but I just wanted to hear a little bit of the, of the motivation. Clearly, you want to be provocative. You want people to take this in. Uh, you want to play with these two notions of free and market. So a little bit more background on that would be phenomenal. The second aspect that I wanted to hear you say a little bit more about is the causal connections between virtue and the free market. Uh, you say at times that virtues serve as a catalyst or a lever, but most often you use the word drivers. So for example, you write at one point, the human virtues of empathy and moral duty were themselves market drivers. Okay, so you've got catalysts, you've got levers, you've got drivers, which create an interesting cluster of meaning, but it would be useful to get a better sense of exactly the nature of this causality that you want us to take away from, uh, from the book. Another, another, another category that you might uh, help us unpack a bit uh, is, is the idea of the state. Uh, so you enumerate a, a, a rather large number of state responsibilities that the writers you treat in the book reference. And these include, and not exclusive to these, but they include responsibility over infrastructure, banks, chartered companies, laws, punishment, regulation, military, economic policy, scientific improvement, standards, weights and measures, grants and bounties to industries, tariffs and taxes, propaganda, education, moral instruction, public finance, colonial administration, workhouses, money supply, and war. So this is, of course, a vast list of different government responsibilities that one could categorize in different ways. You sort of shy away from saying anything more synthetic about what exactly the state needs to be doing. Uh, and I think that would be um, uh, useful. Uh, and it would be interesting to hear you talk about this kind of main category that at the present is, is, is left rather vague. Um, the next question that I had, you, you just already, and that was the, the, uh, the, 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 why the starting point of Cicero and not Aristotle. Aristotle, of course, wrote plenty on, on, uh, on the market and virtue. Uh, but so my question would be, uh, what do we gain analytically and what do we gain narratively by starting with Cicero and not Aristotle? Uh, and the penultimate uh, comment uh, um, is, um, is, is that you, you're, you're offering a, a, a fairly streamlined connection between uh, virtue state and free markets and then on to wealth formation. Uh, clearly, the emphasis is on that triad, the free market virtue and the state. Uh, but there is also that kind of lineage or link to wealth formation in general. And, uh, it seems as though, uh, well, it would be interesting to hear you talk more about the, the, the kind of other variables that would be necessary there. And this is, of course, uh, nothing uh, that's new to you. But I just found it hard to kind of make that uh, lineage work without knowledge, for example. Oh, sure. All right. So, uh, and then finally, the last one. Um, in the last chapter of the book, uh, you bring up China. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't say that you praise, but at least note their successful use of state power to foster free market, or at least the market. Uh, but you don't say much in this chapter uh, about your other explanatory variable, virtue. I can, of course, imagine why you wouldn't do that, but I'd be interested to hear you talk a bit more about that. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I'd just like to say that I am not, nor have I ever been a member of the Communist Party. Let's <laughs> <laughs> we'll start with that. Um, this, this being filmed, yeah, I'm glad that I had that opportunity to state myself purely. Um, well, first, Pierre, he took, takes a different task because he definitely admires some of these people, these visionaries, who see the power of harnessing pleasure and desire and greed to try and turn it into a system, and they're not completely wrong. And I do think they are absolutely interesting figures. Um, I just don't, I, so I think you were saying, why am I, why don't, why don't I give them more credit? Is that sort of your question? 
harm. I mean, I feel like I do, but I also feel like that is a kind of, um, well, it's a, it's a brilliant insight, and I think I, I underline it, but I don't think it's a brilliant insight for running an economy. I think that in some ways, there's an awareness of, of need and greed that goes way, way back. And that's been something we've been struggling with for a long time. Jean Doma, who comes up with this idea of sins canceling out sins, is a wonderful idea. I just don't necessarily think that it works. Um, so I guess I am skeptical of that idea that you can drive an economy simply by desire. And that goes to my, that goes straight to someone like Hayek, that the, all you needed was demand and supply. That was it. And, and I don't think that's the case. Um, and so I admire them. I give them their place. Um, I do admire Mandeville because he's such, you know, he's such a troublemaker, right? Um, I admire La La Rochefoucauld above all of them because he is skeptical of this desire. Um, you know, he thinks that something has, something has to be done about it. He's an Augustinian. So maybe I sit more with La Rochefoucauld and saying, look, this is a powerful force. What's going to become of it? Something we can discuss, but there's no obvious outcome. Good can come, but bad can come too. I mean, I would think that that's what I picked up from, from and La Rochefoucauld thinks we're going to need more morals possibly to handle this. That the morals of a court, of a mercantile court, where things are bought and sold and traded in this kind of horrific way, is not the great chivalric ideal that he, that he wanted. Um, now John, um, <laughs> I, speaking of St. Augustine, I felt that you came to me as an Augustinian monk um, asking for, for virtue. Where is the virtue in all this? And can it be found? And can humanity be saved from itself? Um, and you said that I'm optimistic. Of course, I'm not. I, I will, I'm optimistic as a writer, not as a person. You know, you're not going to sit around and write. I don't want to write a negative book. But I spend my nights not sleeping and in total terror of the situation that we're in. But I mean, talking about that, that's, that's not that interesting, is it? Um, but then you made this point, which I think is super interesting. And yes, this is what I was doing. This, why do I think that history can be used to change people's minds? Because of my last book about accounting, which seemed like nerdy and weird and like wasn't clear that that was going to be interesting, I am regularly flown into governments sit there and tell them historical stories so they make accounting reforms. And I, I make it to right-wing people, left-wing people, far-right-wing people, far-left-wing people, even some centrists, like all four of them left in the world. Um, and, um, and this stunned me when it happened in Greece, that I would just go to one room after the next with completely different people, and we'd make this case about management accounting reform being really, really good for your country, which I truly believe, and I could make the case with historical language. It, 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 it seems sort of remarkable, especially if I got to tell stories from history, and especially if I used PowerPoints with really cool paintings on them, seriously. And so I'm still doing this. I do it all the time. And so I was stunned to what effect history had, and then it, economists are trying to use it. They don't use it very well. It's something I argue with them about. I'm like, if you guys are going to use this, you need to use it better. But I do think it's a really powerful tool to sit and tell people fairly credible historical stories which don't have some partisan tilt to them and they can connect with them rhetorically and in some way. I found this to be the case more in Europe and Asia than the United States, which is something to consider. Um, I do it more in both of those continents. Actually, I do it all the time there and I've been doing uh, yeah, less here. So that's an interesting question. But I do believe history is still a great policy and human language to talk about policy with, rather than the hard certainty of economic stuff, which I find can be deeply upsetting, actually. By the way, we, we also learned never to use the word accounting. That upset people, too, so we found a euphemism for it. So you have to be careful. You learn this. But so I really did have an experience doing this, and we got the Greeks to make these reforms, and the reforms helped them. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, oh my god, we did it. It took years. So anyway, that was like something that actually happened. Um, so history is a form of critique. History is a form of discourse. I think it's really important. 
question and that's underlying this. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, Carl, you threw a lot of questions at me. Um, the first one I want to, um, I just want to get to why Cicero and not Aristotle. Well, it's the historical reason they're not citing Aristotle. Mm. They're not using him to make the case of a, a self-driven market. If you read Diophiki's, um, if you read On Ends, the Finibus, I mean, Cicero repeats himself a lot, which is helpful because, I mean, Definibus and Diophikis, you can I've actually confused it in a lecture and brought it in and started reading from it, and it works. You can actually kind of replace them. Because he has this idea that love and friendship, which he considers to be the same thing, are these drivers. It's not greed, it's love. Mm. Hypocrite, you can call him whatever, that's a remarkable insight. And so that I mean, Cicero, I don't know, maybe he even affected the Beatles. You know, I mean, he's sort of everywhere. Um, and, um, no, so the reason I did it is because everyone's citing Cicero and the passages are there, they're really, really clear. You don't get so much of that in the hard, rough, Greek world of Aristotle. I mean, Aristotle's not gonna sit and talk about the wonders of love, which is not, you know, he's hanging out with Alexander the Great. It's not like a loving situation. Cicero was hanging out with rough people too who killed him, but he was definitely more into this idea. And I see Cicero also, there's a reason for this, is that Cicero is this martyr who I believe is a parallel martyr to Jesus of Nazareth. And we never lose Cicero's work and throughout the history of Christianity, Cicero goes along with this Christian ride, all right? And he's often brought in. He is rejected by the early fathers of the church, but then he's adopted again in the Middle Ages. Even Aquinas adopts him. And so he's very useful to Christian thinkers. E either they're trying to say that he's wrong and that rather than friendship, and it should be the love of God, but they still are using a Ciceronian language. It's unbelievable. So he really is deep in this culture. You can like it, you can hate it, that's not my business, but he's deep in there and we should know that and we should be aware of that. And he's had great, great, great effect. Um, then you, you sort of asked me, oh, why the title? I mean, I don't know, it, looked, it sounded great, you know, it sounded good. Um, I don't think one should get too neurotic about a title and I don't really have a choice because if I did, some person in this room would just tell me to be quiet and make the decision for me, who happens to be my editor, who also is involved with the choice of this title. So I'm gonna pump that one to her. She can defend that. Um, <laughs> no, I think, I think we got it right. I think you're right, though. I think that, I think there is an issue, and I'm worried about this, that we've already seen this, that reviewers are picking this up, thinking that I'm gonna be celebrating the free market completely. I do celebrate it. I do celebrate the idea of this remarkable line of thought. I do celebrate individual liberties and political and economic liberties. I like them. I consider a freely elected state to be part of those liberties. I feel, I mean, I don't think that goes way, way back too, that we come together as individuals, we vote, that's a social contract, and then we can do other things along with our individual acts. That is just called to be in a society. So, I might get some trouble for this title as people pick it up thinking it's something else. And that actually is an issue which I've already run into. We'll see what happens. You can read everything that is written on Amazon and I can tell you I know it's gonna get, there are gonna be lots of unhappy customers. Um, but maybe there'll be some happy customers too. Um, what does the state need to do? Well, you're right, I don't go into it. Um, to my deep belief in high quality public education and literacy. Every time I come across a society that you see creating wealth and creating wealth for more people, it's usually a society with high levels of literacy. And that's one thing that people ask me about. I'm like, yes, we do see some patterns. We can see them in, in Tuscany in 1375, where John Majami thinks that 75% of the population is very literate. It's, 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 it's not a, an accident that the Renaissance comes out of there. And then, yes, I do think the Renaissance is amazing. I do. Um, you see it in Golden Age Holland, staggering literacy. So almost all of these ages, whatever the problems may be and whatever the crimes that may be committed, you also see certain levels of achievement created through great moments of literacy. And so I guess, what can the state do? It can keep people literate and healthy and moving around. Um, 
And then, you know, and then it, I can go further. But those questions are hard, and we can get some of that stuff wrong. I don't think that education we get wrong. That's one. Of, I think that's it's, it's a hard one. We struggle with it, but I, say, I think that as an idea, it's, it's not a hard one. Finally, China. Um, the reason I wrote about China is because I watched someone who works in Asia now a lot. And before I went to Asia, I remember my former college roommate from Cambridge coming back and saying, oh my god, you don't understand what's going on there. And I didn't understand what was going on there. Um, I feel like the American people were told over and over again that if they were just free and riding motorcycles and that everything was going to work out, they were the greatest. And if, they, and if they had free market thought and deregulation, it was all going to work out for them. And then one day they woke up, and China turned into partially the richest country in the world, not necessarily doing that. I think that's caused a massive shock. Nobody told them what was going on. And by the way, the people in the companies and the politicians that traveled, a lot of them knew what was going on, just like my friend, who is a giant business person. He knew what was going on in China, because he was like going and making money off of it. Um, and so I think that I don't want to argue whether the Chinese are virtuous or not. I think that's I see, I see lots of virtue in China when I go, um, and I see just like here I see other problems. I, I don't like authoritarianism, and that terrifies me. I think that that's not virtuous. I think that that is the antithesis of virtue. Um, but I think that that one of the things that happened is because of Colbert and the story that a state couldn't create wealth. Americans and, and even Europeans were lulled into this idea that China and other countries that were authoritarian couldn't challenge us economically. We have learned that that is not true. And I think Russia, which is just a completely different kettle of fish, you know, sort of made us sleepy about that. Like, oh, the Russians, you know, they're never going to make it. Um, but China, no. And China had a very pointed industrial strategy, not only about infant industry, but about manufacturing. We can argue whether you need technological manufacturing in your country, or as someone like Larry Summers thinks, we need to farm it out. That's an argument that's still going on. I can go back and forth on that one, depending on the case. Um, but I do think people have ignored China and its force and its own engagement with free market thought um, and, and the efficiencies of production at their own peril. Um, however, one of the things I make clear in the book is that Colbert mixed science and culture and trust with his state project. And when I go to places like Taiwan, and I actually talk to people from mainland China, I say, where do you want to work? And they say, I want to work in mainland China so I can make money. I said, do you drink the milk in mainland China? And they all laugh, of course we don't drink the milk. We don't trust it. And I say, right, so you come to Taiwan to drink the milk. I said, okay, that's a problem for China. You, people don't actually want to drink mainland Chinese milk. They want the job, they want the money, but they want Taiwanese milk. Seriously, this is like the big discussion that I've had in like rooms across Asia. It's super, super interesting. I'm like, so this project does differ from a project, for better or for worse, I mean, at the time, Colbert was trusted as having made something that was verifiable and trustworthy, whether it was or not, and that was pretty brilliant. Anyways, I think that is, um, that's why I speak about China with some, the, the admiration of a place that did manage to do all this in spite of what we were told. I do say the dangers of authoritarianism could bring it all down, us too. I really believe that. That's one thing I believe is that authoritarianism is utterly dangerous. As I, by the way, I just wanna, I repeat this to my students all the time, Nazis are bad, okay? I just, I just wanna throw that in there. It's like my message of the year, okay? It's just like it hasn't changed, okay? Um, but, you know, we're having a, a leader of Italy who actually says the opposite, so that's scary. I hope that that answers the questions. I got to put in my Nazis are bad statement, which I'm trying to put out there everywhere. Um, and, a, and it's a Swede that's well taken, especially yeah, this day, well, yeah. after yesterday's election. After yesterday's election, yes. freaked me out. Um, but anyway, um, so I'm not as optimistic as one might think. But these are all amazing questions. The book doesn't have all the answers. I hope that it sort of sparks people to talk about these things and to talk about things historically. If we keep talking only in, this, in a journalistic way, I don't think we're going to go anywhere. So I might be blamed about journalism, yeah, in the first pages and the last pages, but dig into my footnotes at the end. I did the work, the real horrific historical work, which is super hard, which is why we don't always do it. It's, it's really, really hard. And then you mess stuff up, and people attack you, and it's terrifying. So, you know, or you say nice things carefully to me, and I'm like, 
wondering if you mean it, and I hope it's good. <laughs> um, anyway, I hope that sums it up. <laughs> Phenomenal question, and you're totally right. And I, this is actually on my mind. I partially agree with her that in an ideal world, that is the case. But I see capital as based on naval and military power. I'm a cynic, and and I would ask, does China have functioning contract law? I mean, do the owners of Chinese companies, do they really have full control over their companies? Does it mean that China doesn't have capital and isn't, isn't rich because it's not actually always the case? And that stuff can be taken away from you more easily in China? It can be taken away from you here too. But we do have a, a more straightforward form of contract law. Um, I, I'm afraid that I do, I guess, I mean, I'm looking at the Place des Vosges. I'm formed in a time when these things were based on the size of your navy. I mean, also the quality of your industry and messages you could put out and laws. I mean, but all of it was seen, laws and also rules and, and expertise and literacies, they all worked together to create confidence in something that could be called capital. Um, by the way, a lot of the capital you mentioned is imaginary too, right? So it's, it's in contracts, it's in imaginations, is it really there, it could disappear tomorrow with a, a shift in the market, a shift in the weather, right? Um, so yes, I agree with you, and I haven't used that word, although I do talk about law in the book, um, but I'm also very focused on navies because that's actually how they saw it too. Well, they did see the law, but they also saw lots of other elements. Um, and I do think that interestingly enough, the arguments that we're having about international relations now aren't about law, they're about maritime power once again in the South China Sea. Um, and I just read a book about it, and I was like, wow, plus ça change, except it's a lot more dangerous now because those boats are carrying nuclear weapons, a lot of some of them. Um, so, yeah, that's a great point. I just wanted to sort of add to the complexity of it. I don't know if that answers your question. So, thanks.
for, I just want to hit the state point first. I always notice that people only start attacking the state once they've built one. When you don't have a state, you don't want to attack the state because you need a state. So it's kind of like, I don't know, criticizing your mom or something, you know? Um, but no, I really mean that. So, so historically, you, when there are th these moments where the state breaks down, people are not attacking the state. When the state's nice and stable, everybody starts attacking it. And then the state can get pretty creepy. And I do say I admire people like Hayek who saw the dangers not only of fascism, but of um, without seeing the role that markets and capitalists played in, in, in that, but also in the dangers of totalitarian communism, which I think too, people, too many people um, were too complacent, many of my former teachers in France, for example. And, and so I really admire uh, Francois Furet's uh, Livre Noir, even a black book of communism, which I was like, yes. And, and it was like heresy in France, but no. So I, I think that the state is uh, an interesting concept. And I do think that Louis XIV state got really scary. There, if you were a book, if you wrote a pamphlet, you could get sent to the galleys for it. There were spies everywhere breaking up printing shops. That was a scary state. So, and it was a remarkable state because it was, there hadn't been states that had been that scary and that well run in that way. So I think that that is um, interesting. I do want to say that I don't see continuity. I see the, u the constant use of tools and discourses. There are all these discontinuities. They mean very, very different things. But there are some continuities because of agrarian society. So, while agrarian society exists, you have this continuity of this argument that goes on from Cicero really until the mid 18th century that the land is the source of all wealth, even though there are Italians in the Renaissance saying, no, it's actually, it's actually our hands in the creativity of humans. Um, uh, but there's a, there's a dominating discourse that says that. Today, people wouldn't think that, but that's where free market thought came from. It finally sort of falls apart, but Smith, Smith writes The Wealth of Nations while giving a room for James Watt to do his work in and never mentions the Industrial Revolution. The nail factory is not a modern factory. There are all these looms. By the time he does the final edition of The Wealth of Nations, there are these looms everywhere. It's like, as I say in the book, it's like writing a book about economics today sitting in San Francisco and not mentioning anything about tech or programming. It's kind of crazy. And that's something that I think needs more study. Why would he have done that? Well, I think because of these agrarian beliefs that he had. Um, soon afterwards, well, Ricardo's going to believe in those beliefs, and um, Mill is going to struggle with them. And slowly in the 19th century, as industry takes over, they're going to disappear. So I think there is an odd opportunity in this of a certain kind of continuity, but the ideas are used in different ways. But because you have the earth as this not only center of wealth, but of social prestige and capital, by the way, that's why you don't get Jews writing about free market thought or other people, because you have to be a landowner. And in Europe, to be a landowner, that means you have to be a Christian white guy. Okay? And so those are the people who are going to be writing about free market thought until some things change. All right? um, and I'm writing an article about that right now, actually. Um, so there are discontinuities, but I do think there is this remarkable thing. That's why Cicero keeps coming up. What's interesting is when he comes up for industrial peoples, and they just twist what he says, which I think is the way it works. Renaissance um, businessmen say, Cicero says it's great to be a businessman. No, he doesn't. He says there's nothing worse than a Mercator or a Syrian. You know, du sachant, right? So um, yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. But I think this did offer a remarkable opportunity to write a book like that. I didn't write it because I set out to do this. I wrote it because it panned out that way. That's why the book came in late. That's why it was so hard, because it kept rolling outwards. And it kept getting harder and harder to pull everything together. Yeah? Can I ask a question about um, the way um, you got some of the last question, but also the question on the, uh, the, the role of, um, of history as critique? Uh, because it seems to me that in the book, there is a genealogy, a very strong genealogy from Cicero to the late 18th century. And then there is something like a break, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you, you, yeah. you show Ricardo still kind of uh, yeah. falling to me to some extent, but not much. I mean, so, but there is a break, right, in the 19th century. And you tell us, actually, if I understand you well, or maybe I didn't, uh, that uh, today we should recover something that is in that genealogy from, you know, pre 19th century edits of the market, right? Mm -hmm. so that can be useful. But I'm wondering, uh, first of all, how, how do we recover this, right? Because it's a break, how do we go beyond that break? 
I mean, that's, that's what I say in the last line. I didn't want to show my hand. Um, there's a lot about Cicero not to like, but this idea of public virtue and service, yeah, I really believe in that. And I believe that. I remember at one part, point, a friend of mine had had dinner with the president of France, Giscard. And Giscard said that he was deeply concerned that the best people were no longer going into government. This is a long time ago. As they had, they were going into business. And he saw this as a threat to the state. And that's always stuck with me. Giscard had a lot of problems, but he was also actually quite wily and had a lot of insight and understood the state. And I thought, wow, that is serious. So the problem is, yes, I think we need to go back and study the liberal arts, even though the Washington Post said everyone who does so is miserable. They're not my students. I, I see students loving the liberal arts and going on and having good lives. That was a weird article in the Washington Post. Um, but so yeah, I mean, I guess I'm kind of an idealist in the end in this old thing, but I don't like oligarchy, but there's, and I don't like these closed elites that Cicero liked, but I do think that public service and this kind of selfless virtue is really, really important. Without it, I don't know what happens to us, because these great moments that we've had where humans do make up for all the bad things they've done, but, I mean, or try and make up, are these moments of some kind of public service and some kind of selflessness sometimes, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I didn't want to, I didn't want to make a moral speech in the book, but I obviously believe that. And there's one last thing, and this gets back to John's thing, and this is problematic, and we can argue about it. I mean, maybe we've messed up by taking our eye off of agriculture and, and good husbandry and reading these totally reactionary books by Cato and Varro that talk about the importance of treating nature well. Maybe they had something there. <laughs> I mean, and also treating, I mean, and then getting back to other ideas of people like St. Francis, treating animals well. Um, I mean, that was something I didn't want to open up in the book. I thought it would get a little crazy. But yeah, and I don't know how we do that, but that's a question that has like literally haunted me. I'm like, I keep criticizing these agrarian guys, and yet there is this part of agrarianism which was super repressive and horrific and was futile and related to slavery, but it also meant focusing on the land and knowing it, knowing what was bad for it. And boy, have we lost that. I mean, wow. So I don't know if that's a great response. But. It is. The night before the floods, I gave a, ta a, a talk to the, the Pakistani Institute for Development Economics, which was one of the most intense experiences I've ever had and actually kind of left me stunned. And it was the night before. Um, I don't know if you saw that. It was really one of the most amazing experiences I've had um, and upsetting in a lot of ways because it ended with them saying, we feel our situation is hopeless. And that was before the floods. And it was like all these brilliant people saying that in this room. It's like, whoa. Um, I think that Pakistan has to find its own way. I do not think it's going to come from outside. That's something we talked about. I really do think that. Um, I, I, but I think that, I think Pakistan is in a very tough situation. So I don't know what to say to Pakistan. And that's how we sort of ended our conversation. Um, but we did talk about the need. One of the things that they said was that Pakistan had never Pakistan actually had all these incredible moments of development. It's actually one of these crazy places that you want to study when you see development, success, and failure. It's really quite extraordinary in economic history. But the one thing that Pakistan never focused on was creating an, an internal scientific establishment. 
And that was something we all had kind of agreed on that had been disastrous for the country because they had the brains, they had the traditions to start with, all those brains left, and they never created their own scientific um, system to deal with, with science and to have some kind of mastery over technology and science for themselves. I mean, that, that's just the Pakistani response, and I'm only giving it to you because I just had this amazing experience there. But I do think that it is extremely dangerous to ever try and apply a system to a place. Everything is specific. There might be places, for example, Pakistan has a state-run car industry that's making cars, that's protected, cars from models from the 1950s. Might be fun to own with an engine built somewhere else because it's a 1950s car, but it's kind of a disaster too. So protectionism in the state, but does Pakistan really have a state? I mean, we could just go on and on. Pakistan's so interesting. But I do think that was another message. So you need your own kind of scientific establishment to have wealth in this economy and, and to face the things that we're doing, dealing with. Um, and you also can't have it necessarily completely coming from the outside. It just doesn't work. And in the end, they said, well, what do you think, what do you think will happen to us? And I said, we will steal your brains. That's what we're going to do. It's a brain economy. We're going to steal all Pakistani brains. And now with this blood, it's going to be even easier to do. So that was a sad, horrific answer, and that's how we ended the, the, the session before the floods. And like then the next day the floods happened, I was just like, oh my god, this is like, wow, super heavy. So yeah, those are not easy answers to those questions. I just have two great questions. The first being was so how does the deal of free market and profit possible itself and its affecting the nature of the industry, especially with the personal life and how we focus on the self into the twentieth century and even the century itself of hyper consumerism and that interaction with free market um, ideas. And secondly, more so in Western focus lens, how does the free market fit that Wait, let me just get, can you just repeat the second part of the question again? Of course. So the second part was more so focused on how the myth of a free market translates into the general psyche and people buy into that market in and of itself to ensure that it succeeds. That's a hard question. Um, well, the self one is um, just, you know, we, the definition of the self changes all the time and what an individual is and what virtue, what individual virtue is all the time. My grandmother is 103 and she was born in Germany and she has a really different vision of virtue. I mean, she thinks I'm profoundly unvirtuous because I am an Epicurean and I, I mean, in, in the modern sense, not in the true ancient sense. Um, and I consume too much and, and you know, she thinks that's completely unvirtuous, and she thinks I don't do enough public service. I, I, mean, I mean, really, literally. So I've grown up in a world where someone had a very different idea of what being, of what a self meant, and what individual action should be used for. Um, and she was from, I think, a time when it was, you know, money was not to be spent necessarily, except on education and books and a few things like that, um, for real. Um, how do people then buy into free markets? Well, who does buy into free markets, right? Um, really interesting. As I was writing the book, I traveled around the world, and I'd always just sort of ask people, do you believe in free markets? I just wanted to know. I wanted to get. And the biggest laughs I got were from my billionaire acquaintances. And that, I think, is really, really interesting. Um, they subscribe to a certain newspaper, um, which says it's for free markets, and they all laugh about it in, in, the, in the back rooms. Um, at the same time, some of them, I think, actually have some virtues and, and real talent, and they say, I'm not breaking any laws, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing, you know, but to get people to buy into it, who buys into it, in what way, lots of people have different ideas of free markets. I have a free market idea. I mean, when I own property in France, I ended up becoming furious because I was constantly being harassed in my, that's a very American right-wing concept. I was constantly being bothered by the French state to the point where I got rid of my apartment because I was like, I can't have this when I'm busy. 
At the same time, what I did notice in French property law is it protected poor people, and I was like, interesting. That would be nice to have here. Um, but then again, you can't flip apartments and make money in the same way, and so we have to think about what we value. I, I don't know how much has changed in France since I sold my apartment, but it was like a really interesting thing because I was angry about what was happening, but I was reading the laws that I had to deal with, and I was like, wow, these laws are actually pretty good. But, so does France not have a free market? I have plenty of American friends. I had one guy write me and said, well, but you know, Europe's in a dictatorship. And I was like, oh, right, that's what you think. A guy from Florida wrote me this. I was like, okay. I mean, I didn't really know how to respond to that. I was like, it does, I said, this just doesn't. I think you should go and check it out. You should probably just go to like Spain and have a good time. And then we can talk after you spend a couple of weeks in Spain um, or Portugal. Just go have a good time and then come up with your idea. Um, but so it's, it's in the eye of the beholder, right? I mean, there are all these things that I like about free markets. And I get grumpy when stuff isn't on time. And I like the stuff that I can buy. And I notice that my life has become, in many ways, more, become easier as I've gotten more money. Without money, things are horrific. Like healthcare gets really scary. Doctors look at you in a different way when you don't have money. It's all crazy or if you're of a certain gender or race. So what is free market? Who believes in it in what way? I definitely believe in parts of free markets. I definitely want parts of those. There are other parts I don't believe in. So it's a hard question. And then the self and the individual, I mean, that one's just super hard, but we do have to struggle with this, whether we like it or not, because there ain't gonna be enough of stuff really soon, we're already there. We're maxed out, so it's time for a new way of thinking about all these things if we have time. Do we have time for another question? <laughs> Maybe. One word, mustard. Um, some of the wealthiest people in France right now are trying to get their hands on mustard, but they don't realize that there's actually a fair amount of it here. The mustard crop burned this year in Canada, Burgundy, and then it got lost in, the, in Ukraine. Um, there's a mustard shortage. I grew up in France, I eat mustard with everything. I need a certain kind of mustard. There's a shortage of it, but I read the commodities markets, so I bought a lot of mustard in advance, and I've got a mustard supply. I collect wines, the wines that I buy, they're not gonna be around in a few years in the same way. Should I drink those wines? Probably, but if I save them and they don't get cooked in the heat in California, they might be worth a lot of money. The age of plenty is going. My father is a scientist, he said the ocean is dying, and then proceeded to tell me in all the horror the way the ocean was dying, and then to say, ah, eh, we're just gonna evolve with it. I was like, no, no, you're 70s man, I'm not. You're not gonna be, that's like not good news. Like, he's somebody from the 70s who's like, yeah, no, we'll find a way around it. I'm like, we're not going to find a way around the mass death. Salmon's going to get tougher. All these things are, we, we, the age of abundance, I don't want to, you know, quote Matt Calm because I really don't like him. Um, but the age of abundance is over. You have all that cash. Will you, who will, there are lots of people also without cash, but the stuff that you can buy with it is going to start disappearing. And there's just no question. And so... Money is one thing, mustard is another. And people are fighting over mustard in France right now. Um, and literally, I had somebody joke to me that if I arrived with a huge amount of my high-end mustard, I could make like 20 grand with a few suitcases. And I was like, hmm. You know, and so I'm just saying, I mean, I'm not actually being completely facetious with that response. It's actually true. There are other things you can find too. Hey, I mean, find me some oil in Europe this winter, okay? Because it's gonna be a bad scene. Abundance is changing and disappearing with climate change. And we're gonna see what happens. We'll see what all the trillions in the world can buy you with there if we have lots and lots of big problems. So I do think there's a difference of an abundance of theoretical money and legal capital and actual stuff. So yeah, that's, that's, that's my thought. Um, thank you. I think we're